Warning. The following podcast contains politics, leftist politics, the whole truth, justice, American way thing. We live in a time where one has to post this. Progress is a dirty word, such as science and reason. My superheroes would weep. This podcast contains naughty language as well. All right, everyone, welcome to DC Domingo number 46. Um... We are ranking the top comic book movies of all time. Um, I am uploading this before the Oscars. Um, and there seems to be a lot of people who are kind of going, Yay, Black Panther is nominated for you know Oscars. And while it's not the first comic book movie to do so, given that The Dark Knight uh, did that prior, um, there's a lot of interest on in, you know, what good comic book movies ought to be and unfortunately because a lot of film critics did not actually go to film school they're failed uh <laughs> film directors a lot of these people don't uh, continue their academic necessities so they're not really well versed sometimes they can't even read the books that some of these movies are based on you know and if you are a legitimate movie critic they will laugh at you, even if you didn't read, you know, Da Vinci Code or stuff like that. Um, but when you're a, you know, comic book journalist, they don't laugh at you if you don't know what the fuck you're talking about. <laughs> so we have a lot of people who are in the mainstream who have no fucking idea what the characters and tradition and all these uh, movies have been. But very, very often they'll just splur out their shit without ever knowing what the fuck they're talking about. So, in this episode, um, I will be talking a few of, you know, the coolest things that I like. Uh, for instance, I'm going to start with my top 10 um, best underrated cult classics in a non-ironic hipster kind of way, you know, like actually fucking loving these films. Um... So we're going to have 10 of those. Um, also, we're going to have top 10 pop culture movies based on comic books. You know, it's kind of like, regardless of the quality of the movies, if it impacted pop culture, you know. Um, now, the other thing that we're going to do, we're going to have top 10 films that are based on comic books. Um, to give you an example, it would be like Fight Club or The Godfather. Uh, movies that stand on their own, that were based on other materials. Um, some of you might say, well, isn't that adaptation? No, that's my next topic. <laughs> Top 10 best uh, adaptation films, meaning that, you know, what they took from the comics, they translated it to screen um, almost perfection, almost imperfection. So I do have that. And last but not least, my top personal favorite films, which may or may not be in the other categories. So hopefully this episode will hit 52 minutes, because uh, that's a beautiful number for DC Comics. <laughs> and um, yeah, so we're going to start um, with the best underrated cult classics, best pop culture comic book movies, best actual films, best adaptations, and best personal favorites. All right. Ironic hipster comic book movies, uh, cult classics. Um, this is a kind of a fun little thing, and I discovered a couple of things in Mexico, 
we have Kaliman, um, and I always thought that he was based on you know comics. Uh, it turns out comics were made after the radio show was uh, was produced. So Kaliman is actually uh, based on a radio, which is kind of interesting. Also, um, Zorro uh, is actually based on uh, books. So uh, we missed out on that one too. Anyways, uh, I mentioned this because there is um, a series of connected movies called Chanuk. And he's kind of like a, you know, Doc Savage kind of character with a lot of adventures. Um, there seems to be a nice handful of those movies. They're from Mexico and they're pretty, it's kind of like a um, 1960s, uh, you know, thriller. The next one is Ichi the Killer. It is based on a manga, I know, from Japan, but it's still a comic book. Um, it is a very disturbing fucking movie. <laughs> um, definitely not for the faint of heart. And uh, basically it features um, a dude with superpowers who throws tantrum and he's just kind of fucked in the head. Um, it features a mob boss who's kind of like, um, has scars like the Joker on the side of the face. Um, it's really fucked up. <laughs> and, uh, you know, you should check it out if you're not squeamish about gore. And I don't know if it's gore porn, but it's, it's really fucking fucked up movie. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a weird fucking gem from the horror uh, genre. Next one is Dread. I know that um, Sylvester Stallone made Judge Dredd, but I'm talking about the other one, that one that was made very recently, and it looks almost like it was made for, um, you know, for a smaller budget, um, and had um, a much uh, grittier take. It, you know, Mega City One wasn't that big explored. It was just like one city block, one edifice, and um, yeah, it was a pretty fucking badass. Um, I really liked it, and we all hoped there was a sequel, you know. Um, number seven, Black Mask, Jet Li, 1996. Again, it's based on, um, you know, comic books and stuff like that. Um, I know that some people kind of confused it, but like, hey, is this the Kato movie? Um, but no, it's actually based on a character called Black Mask, you know, um, it's, it's interesting. Um, a lot of people don't realize <laughs> that other countries make movies, uh, based on comics, I know, right? So far, I have uh, quite a variety over here. Uh, number six, Time Cop. I know, right? A Van Damme movie based on comics. Um, but yeah, Time Cop was a, was a comic book. And oddly enough, the movie was very fucking satisfying. Um, and if you've seen the Amazon uh, Van Damme series, um, Van Damme Johnson, uh, he even mocks that uh, Looper the movie uh, kind of ripped it off. <laughs> uh, Ryan Johnson, your time cup uh, theory sucked. <laughs> All right, number five is um, definitely a gem. It's called Tank Girl. And if you don't know what it is, um, think of like Harley Quinn, but back in the day when uh, shit was a little bit loonier and crazier, um, like a female Mad Max, or, or I, don't, I, don't know how to, I don't know how to describe it, but it's definitely um, like a crazy fucking movie that I know someone that has tattoos of her and kind of dresses, you know, according to the comics and stuff. So very interesting. Um, another one that I think is really amazing, and number four, is The Immortals um, with Henry Cavill. Why, um, quite simply because the director, uh, Tarzem, um, fuck dude, he's just a visual, a uh, genius. And the way he tells the story with the budget he has creates an epic, um, it's just a glorious movie to behold. And it's based on a comic and the figures do look like Greek, you know, um, gods and goddesses uh, with stellar performances you know, by Mickey Rourke. Fucking awesome. Check it out. Number three, I have a, I have another movie from Japan. Uh, 
Battle Royale. Um, if you don't know what it is, um, think of it like the... Um, what is it called? Um, Mockingjay, uh, the Hunger Games, basically. But this is a little bit different. A um, bunch of high school kids um, placed on an island, and there's a bunch of weapons, and the goal is to survive. It's based on a manga, and um, it's a, it's another one of those movies where, like, um, you know, when the days of uh, video rentals and stuff like that, it was one of those in the cult section, and uh, all the hipster um, video store clerks were recommended, even if, you know, um, you were kind of clueless about it. But yeah, I really liked it. Uh, friends of mine had it, so I just borrowed it from them and didn't fucking bother with the goddamn hipsters in the video store, right? <laughs> um, so yeah, that's my number three choice for um, underrated cult classics. Now, Number two, I don't like to do this, but I kind of have to. It's um, it's a tie between two films uh, from the 90s, mind you. And my criteria is that you have to watch them in black and white. I am, of course, talking about The Shadow with Alec Baldwin. Um, that's one film that, oh man, you just really have to see it in black and white. I have some... Um, you know, some fans who have never seen this, but do yourself a favor, watch it in black and white. It tied also with Billy Sane and The Phantom. Um, interestingly enough, The Phantom is also um, a hero from Africa, also created by white people, <laughs> passed down from generations, the mantle from generations to generations to generations. Um, yeah. It's, it's very similar to another one. Hmm, I wonder where they got the idea from, right? <laughs> but yeah, do yourself a favor and watch these two movies, The Shadow and The Phantom, in black and white. Because they are pretty fucking amazing. And um, the main, um, my favorite, in a non-ironic hipster shit kind of way, uh, comic book movie is, of course, Flash fucking Gordon. Now, I know what you're thinking. You probably think that um, Flash Gordon originated in the, um, you know, in some kind of a TV show, but actually it was created to compete with Buck Rogers. It's a common misconception. Buck Rogers existed in the black and white cinema, the movie serials, which is where Star Wars George Lucas got his ideas from. Um you know, of space operas, but no, uh, actually Flash Gordon, I'm talking about the ones, the movie in the, <laughs> in the eighties, um, just as the seventies were, were ending in the eighties were starting. It's the one with the awesome, um, Queen Flash, uh, theme song. I know it's pretty cheesy, uh, but as a kid, I saw that movie and I was like, holy shit, this is awesome. And, um, I know that the movie has been kind of, um, paid a homage to in a uh, in the family guy creator movie i forget which one it was it was kind of a forgettable fucking movie um but yeah i genuinely love this film and it's genuine love um so yeah that's my top spot for cult comic book movie all right so the next category is um pop culture comic book movies um how do i explain this well remember how um the movie the fugitive uh starring harrison ford was kind of a big thing when it came out um i know that the book that it was based on you know it had a nice following but that movie kind of um blew it out of the ballpark and it was kind of like the reemergence of harrison ford as a as a badass action hero um, in the 90s after, you know, he did all the cool stuff in the 80s. So it was pretty awesome. Also, if you um, if you remember The Shining, that book was really um, niche but quite known. When the movie came out, um, a lot of reviewers hated it. But over time, it has become a giant, impactful movie. Um, that's the kind of movies that I'm talking about. 
And, um, you know, that's why the, there's this criteria. People seem to think that, you know, that's what a movie should be now. <laughs> and that's not how you create a movie. You can't, like, say, well, this movie's great because it made a noise, right? Uh, and yes, I'm starting with uh, Marvel's The Avengers. It was um, big because it was the first time that we saw, like, um, a change in a cinema where, um, you know, I went to see it at midnight because back then I used to like both DC and Marvel. Um, but this was the first one where like 100% of the jokes landed on the preview uh, audience and about only 40% landed on the uh, average moviegoer. Um, and that kind of made me a little bit of worry because like, how is it that like hardcore fans laugh at everything, but average people just get only like a few and that's when i started to go hmm you know when they killed agent colson a lot of people didn't give a fuck about him and i was like it's it was like the taking off the jet you know for franchise superhero movies but on the quality level it was basically transformers with capes and um this movie along with iron man one is the only movies that i own from the mcu <laughs> Um, just because, you know, they, they don't offer anything new besides those two. Um, yeah, it was kind of a, kind of a bummer. I mean, I was really into the special effects. I thought ILM did a great job. Some of the jokes were lame. I kind of wished that Ant-Man and the Wasp were there, you know, kind of set up the sequel with Ultron, but I don't know. Like, I haven't really watched the making of or... Or, or I've seen it again it's entirely since it came out, to be quite honest. So I don't even know why it, the fuck I bought it. Maybe for a memento. Number nine. Much more significant movie. <laughs> Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Um, you see, folks, back after the success of Tim Burton's Batman, a lot of people thought, well, fuck it, that's it. You know, it's Batman, one-off movie. Summer of 89. There's no not going to be another comic book movie. And guess what? Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles from 1990 kicked a lot of fucking ass, and it was kind of monumental. It was one of those movies where it's fucking dark, there's a lot of action, uh, it has the weight and credibility, and average audiences really liked it. Me, as someone who was a little kid who grew up with the Turtles, man, it was fucking awesome. So, yeah, it wasn't so much that Hollywood was like, oh, shit, comic book movies are going to be, like, a thing. But it, it kind of proved that the Batman hype was just, like, not a one-off, you know? Um, number eight, definitely, it is Black Panther. I have other movies up there on the list that I'll tell you more about it. But basically, Black Panther is the, um, the time when social media and bandwagon fans discovered uh black superheroes you see we've had <laughs> we've had other superheroes but this was the one where you know all the right check marks of lists were agreeable you know except for having a white boss in the shape of kevin feach and you know if it does win the best picture the white dude's gonna go up there so it's impactful because it kind of shows you that um, the power of uh, mass marketing, the power of social media, you know, people can't say anything negative about the movie. Uh, for me, it's kind of like Zorro with uh, Antonio Banderas. It's kind of like three stars out of five or, uh, you know, six out of, you know, six, six or seven, you know, out of ten, you know, or like, yeah, six, you know, um, but yeah, if I do say that online, oof, man. But yeah, it's basically like a Zora movie if, uh, you know, Latinos were in charge of social media and, you know, we just said, hey, if you don't like it, you're a racist. You know, it's, it's an okay movie, but it's it's a social movement movie. Um, on top of that, on number seven, I do have one specific one, but it's actually the Unbreakable Trilogy. Now, I know it's not based on comics. However, it is groundbreaking in the cult, pop culture movements because it captured the um, the evolution of comic book movies. 
after M. Night Shyamalan won a lot of prestige for his movie Sixth Sense, he made a movie about comic books and how they are, are an art form and how they translate to the screen as a masterpieces. Um, some people loved, loved that movie, some people didn't, and it took him several years to make not only a sequel, a surprise sequel, but a concluding end trilogy in Glass, which is an amazing movie. So, again, we have a big budget movie, cinematic universe, check, um, a person of color <laughs> as a director, check, um, a very uh, a African-American protagonist, because Glass is protagonist here, um, of maybe the whole trilogy, spoiler alert, um, <laughs> and we have, um, a, a, you know, a trilogy of films that span, you know, uh, almost two decades, so yeah, that's why I think it's impactful, because um, true comic book fans will cherish these movies, even if, like, the norms kind of go, what, I don't get it, and it kind of introduced the norms, as I call them, to comic books back in 2000, and reinvigorated uh, all these hidden gems in uh, this year, 2019. Number six on my list, of course, Wonder Woman, um, which appeals to everybody. Um, you know, I know that there is a lot of hype with Black Panther, but Wonder Woman actually um, came out before. It was kind of, again, um, you know, someone born of royalty who inherited this title, uh, in a hidden land, even the whole, you know, crossing the arms X thing is there, um, but it was more woman empowerment without um, forcing it, you know, it wasn't like, if you don't like this, you hate women, which is what Black Panther did, you know, if you don't like it, you're a racist, um, <laughs> so Wonder Woman actually crossed a lot of um, thresholds and it made history, um, but currently people seem to have forgotten that, you know, didn't remember because it's, I don't know, maybe it's not a Disney movie, but Wonder Woman was pretty fucking badass. And I'm sorry to say that some, uh, journalists and haters were not banned from Rotten Tomatoes, which was the case with Black Panther. So there's preference there. Number five, um, it is... Danger Diabolique from 1968. It's an Italian movie based on Italian comic books, and it's basically what would happen if uh, James Bond was a costume hero. Um, think of like um, the original Jim Steranko, Agent of S.H.I.E.L.D., Nick Fury, or, you know, think about like El Santo from Mexico, um, or The Saint. You know, there's a lot of these uh, awesome, or the Avengers from the UK. Um, it's a very, <laughs> it's a very cool movie, very stylized, very Italian. Um, yeah, it's it was fucking cultural because back in the day, a comic book based movie wasn't like this. There wasn't this variety in the 1960s. You know, this is before the Superman, the motion picture, and it was fucking badass. Go check it out. All right, so for number four, we have a kind of a tie, although it's mostly the first movie, um, Blade, the first Blade movie. Again, African-American superhero, fuck yeah, and it's a Marvel movie, mind you. It was actually um, done over at Warner Brothers <laughs> through New Line Cinema, and it was so fucking good. I mean, it brought back Wesley Snipes in a big way. Now, people would have expected me to say, you know, the second one, because a Mexican directed it, you know, Guillermo del Toro. But actually, the first one has a lot more of a pop culture impact. A lot of dumb fucks would remember Jane Silent Bob Strikes Back and the little bit of monologue of the uh, comic book, Kona Sewer, saying that, well, you see, kids, when X-Men hit it at the box office, it's actually Blade that it kind of started it all for Marvel. Um, and, and if you check out the X-Men movie extras, You'll see that um, Fox actually moved uh, the release date of X-Men to kind of catch up on the heels of the Blade movie success. Um, you'll you'll hear Brian Singer complain about it and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, Blade 
made at Warner Brothers through New Line Cinema had such a big impact that it made the X-Men franchise move up. Think about that shit. And guess who was working over there at Fox? Kevin Feige. He was an underling of the um, uh, Richard Donner and Julie Donner um, producers of the X-Men franchises. So, know your origins, motherfuckers. Number three, Tim Burton's Batman, 1989. Batmania did hit it off. Um, it was the end of the 80s, and, you know, people were used to the campy 1966 Batman. Um, I, I was, you know. <laughs> so when we saw this fucking movie, we were like, whoa, you know, but I was like very fucking little. And it's a movie that I memorized fanatically. But the cultural impact was that people had fucking Batman tattoos, they were making Batman shirts, they were selling out Batman cabs, it was just... A Batman craze. Um, the fact that it was black and yellow was very iconic. Um, whereas the 1960s Batman was a little bit more, you know, chubby and more campy. This was just dark, you know, and it was badass. So that's why it made it to the top three. Now, top two, on the other hand, it was dark and badass for another reason. It was a dark night. <laughs> that's fucking right. Uh, it changed things forever for Hollywood. It was a movie that said, hey, Hollywood, we're this fucking good. Give us more, you know, slots on the Best Picture nomination. And you know what? Fuck yeah. You know, if it wasn't for Dark Knight, Black Panther wouldn't be nominated. Um, and, you know, in many ways, Dark Knight is a fucking great film. But it had a giant cultural impact, not only because it crossed a billion dollars, but because it was a movie that critics, audience, fans, every fucking buddy loved it. And I know the naysayers are, like, criticizing, well, it's only because of the Joker, but now it's actually a fucking movie about Batman, you know, and the struggle that he has to fucking go through. I mean, it ends with defining what is the Dark Knight, as opposed to the White Knight of Two-Face. Fucking amazing. The number one, of course, has to be Superman the Movie by Richard Donner. Why is it big? Um, because, uh, to, uh... <laughs> Mexican-European uh, producers hired Marlon Brando as jor and they had the vision to hire a horror movie director named Richard Donner after The Omen and kind of go balls-to-the-wall, big-budget, epic movie. Back in the day, those, um, there was a lot of catastrophe movies, and, you know, if you notice, there's a lot of catastrophes that Superman has to save, you know, like the airplane in Air Force One, uh, falling, you know, Lois Lane from a crashed helicopter, the Hoover Dam, um, a bus full of children go running off the Golden Gate Bridge, a runaway train on the trail tracks, the whole fucking San Andreas fault. I mean, it technically is a disaster movie, but they put a spin of uh, Superman on it. That's why it's culturally impactful, because they're like, ooh, see, we can translate Superman into a you know, uh, 1970s um, destruction exploitation cinema, and it worked, because it was like the, you know, golden era Superman, where he was just charming, and just like, we're not gonna care about anything else, I mean, if that movie came out again, there's a scene where, like, a mom slaps her daughter for saying lies, that shit wouldn't fly <laughs> in today's, um, you know, society, so, anyways, it was great for its time. And that's why it's the best pop culture movie icon of my list. All right, so we are getting into the best films. Um, now, this is, um, as I was putting this list together, I am reminded of a list that Dark Horizons used to have where they triangulated uh, box office attendance and they even um, rounded up for inflation uh, that was one one of the points the other one was uh, critic reviews and then the other one was um, user reviews they triangulated all of the data and my list kind of looks like it they took it down because well you know trolls <laughs> there were you know a few Marvel movies up there but yeah, uh, they didn't like that shit, so I think Garth Ennis, who runs the website, took it down, because I can't find it anywhere. But here we go. Number 10, A History of Violence. 
uh, Cronenberg, who criticized The Dark Knight, made this movie based on a comic book, right? <laughs> and guess what? We went to see your movie, Cronenberg. We fucking love it. Viggo Mortensen plays this, like, you know, cool, hand look type of dude who's just like, I just want to have a normal life. But fuckers don't leave him alone. Uh, and Harris plays a bad guy, and it's really fucking dark and gritty. And a fucking great acting, great story. Great cinematography, great directing, Mr. Cronenberg. I hate comic book movies. Fucking great. Number nine, Logan. It's one of the best fucking movies ever made based on comics. In my fucking humble opinion. Now, is it all man Logan? Fuck no. They couldn't really adapt that. Even within the MCU, they just couldn't be able to do that. Maybe animated, but even then, they would take shortcuts. Um, Logan, what a best way to end... Um, you know, Wolverine in the cinema. Patrick Stewart plays a really fucked up Professor X and the newcomer who, who uh, I'm hoping takes over Wolverine. Um, she is really fucking vicious and badass. Um, Hugh Jackman gives one of his best performances, a tearjerker to the end. Whew. Number eight, guess what? Another Marvel movie. Wow, for a DC fan, I really do have a lot of Marvel movies up in my list. Hmm, maybe I'm not biased after all. Of course not. I'm talking about Spider-Man uh, by Sam Raimi, the second one. Fucked. I love that movie. Um, let me put it to you this way. There's hardly any movie based on uh, comics that has uh, a cinematic moment like raindrops falling on my head montage. That, I thought, when I first saw the movie, was the, the you know Sam Raimi making fun of... Uh, a French movie or like another movie reference, but no, it was completely fucking original. They were just creating a great cinematic moment right before your eyes. It had a great story. The acting was great. It had a great stakes. The train fighting sequence was amazing. The end was kind of heartbreaking. You know, I thought Mary Jane was going to die, but it had a happy ending, kind of bittersweet ending. It had everything. It had the romance, the action, the drama, the Peter Parker, who actually is Peter Parker. Fuck yeah. Number seven, Road to Perdition. Uh, Tom Hanks is a bad guy. Fuck yeah. 1930s movie directed by Sam Mendes. Fuck yeah. Jude Law is a weird fucked up motherfucker who takes pictures of dead corpse. Fuck yeah. One of Paul Newman's last movies as a mobster? Fuck yeah! I mean, this f fucking movie is really dark. The cinematography is really great. And yeah, it's one of the best ones out there. Do yourself a favor. And if you want to go the extra mile, <laughs> no pun intended, Tom Hanks movie, um, watch it in black and white. You won't regret it. Number six, oh, American Splendor. Harvey P. Carr. <laughs> Paul Giamatti pay, you know, plays Harvey P. Carr, and he is someone who used to be friends with Crumb, the great uh, American comic book artist, and he just plays a dude who's just normal and who has a shitty life and starts to, to draw comics. He can draw really well. He just writes them and uses stick figures, but other artists kind of like go at it, and they... Um, and you know draw everything and the coolest thing is that the filmmakers actually got the real harvey p car in there and his wife and they kind of insert themselves you know half documentary half uh reality half made up uh hollywood stuff and it's kind of a gem to behold to be quite honest um yeah it's a great fucking film uh, within the same vein and with the same kind of taste we have number five ghost world Fuck, I mean, um, it's one of those movies that I first saw when I was a kid, and there were two pe two kinds of people. Uh, the norms, like the blonde lady <laughs> who became a Marvel uh, Black Widow, you know, actress, um, you know, Scarlett Johansson, and the cool people like me, like uh, Thora Birch. Ah, <laughs> oh, man, I wish it was in more movies. But anyways... Um, yeah, Ghost World, um, the journey of someone trying to find their own identity um, in a culture that is full of stupid, dumb fucking people. Simple as that. Number four, another female-centric comic book movie, 
uh, Persepolis uh, by um, Trepasi. I want to say that name. Um, no, it is Majan Satrapi. Uh, how could I forget that? But yeah, even her last name is so cool. It's just embedded in my head. Uh, based on a comic book, and it's an animated film. Again, why can't animated films like these win Oscars? Fucking Disney. <laughs> yeah, um, growing up um, in Iran, she um, witnesses, you know, uh, regime change. And, you know, through the eyes of a small child, you know, she moves abroad and through the eyes of a teenager she kind of like falls in love back with her homeland it's a beautiful film family oriented really dark tones but really surprisingly well done number three watchmen again Whew. yep i keep finding new posters of these um why is it one of the best films well if you have the balls to sit through hours and hours uh about four and something hours, um, you will be treated to a movie that my baby boomer parents, both of them, my mom and my dad, really fucking loved, and they don't watch comic book movies. How about that? Um, and they don't speak English. How about that? <laughs> they were really captivated by this story. They really understood it. They followed it. They didn't find... Um, the dark or disturbing they understood they knew what the the themes were they knew that it was an alternate reality in comparison one of my ex-girlfriends yuppie a uh, couple they were like i'm confused nixon didn't win re-election what's this i'm just like oh god so yeah it's not for everybody but <laughs> fuck it is one of the best films out there and you know it's been years and years since it came out uh christopher nolan said that it was ahead of his time I know that the um, Ant-Man director really praised it. Um, a couple of really high-ranking people really love this movie, and I fucking love it. Number two, surprise, is The Dark Knight. Why is it not number one? I'll tell you. Yes, Dark Knight, number two. I have already said why in the other, you know, in the other versions. You know, great acting, great story. Uh, gives you a, a reason why The Dark Knight is The Dark Knight. Uh, great Joker, great story, great plot, <laughs> great soundtrack. Oh my god, Hans Zimmer, you badass motherfucker. And yes, of course, Nolan. Number one, La Vie de Del. Life of Adele, or Blue is a Warmest Color, as it's called here in the States. Why is it the best film based on a comic book? While it won the Golden Palm in Paris, and Paris has a really good taste in movies sometimes but most of the times they do uh, get it right and this is one of those films that it definitely deserves it great acting great story a heartbreak on the end of course very French <laughs> I love it and um, it's kind of sad and heartbreaking uh, but it is a, it's one of those movies that broke rounds yes you don't hear woke Twitter talking about that one all right uh, best comic book adaptation films. Um, you know how like Lord of the Rings, um, the trilogy. You the trilogy. You can like, you know, never have read the books and still kind of understand the whole fucking thing. It's awesome. I love that trilogy. Um, or how like you can watch Gun with the Wind and not give a fuck about the book. I know that the writer originally didn't like the movie because it probably because it wasn't as racist as her fucking book but the film does stand on its own you know it's a little bit more less racist than the book and it has become like a you know a cinema classic so they were really well ad adapted and i think that sometimes that's something that um critics that have no fucking knowledge of the material they're reviewing are not aware of so here we go number 10 10 10 by um <laughs> none other than of course peter jackson and you know uh steven spielberg fucking great movie the visuals the the themes the story the way the the visuals actually replicate the 10 10 look fuck i've always dreamed of that since i was a kid um I was aware of the Tintin comics 
And I love this movie quite a bit. Nine? Ho ho ho. You guys are not even fucking ready for this. All right? It's a Marvel movie. And it's fucking badass. It's called Punisher Warzone. Yeah. <laughs> Before the hipster fucks, we're recommending you Punisher on Netflix. This fucking movie. Oh, man. Kicked it up a notch. And I don't know if you read the... You know, the Punisher War Journal or um, those kind of uh, Max uh, series from Marvel. They were very adult, very dark. Um, this movie kind of replicates the fucking look out of the ballpark, but also stands on itself as a really great movie. Uh, the director, which is a female, she fucking did an amazing job. And I'm kind of surprised that like she hasn't been invited back to Marvel. I don't know. Maybe she likes to direct her own action movies, and the thought of somebody saying, hey, don't worry about the action movies, made her go, ha, ah, fuck you. I know, right? Speaking of action, Scott Pilgrim at number eight. Um, oh, man. The way um, Edgar Wright just kind of edited this this movie, it's a uh, really quick tempo on the go, um, but also the visuals really do match the comic. Uh, the characters look like they're supposed to. Um, it's very fun, it's very iconic, it breaks the fourth wall every once in a while, it's very winky winky, stuff like that, just like the, just like the comics, so, pretty fucking awesome. Now, we have a very recent movie, it's called Alita Battle Angel by Robert Rodriguez, oh fuck, man, you guys should see this on IMAX, I didn't, but I want to now. Uh, it's one of those movies where, like, if you read uh, the manga, you're going to be like, wow, they took this shit straight out of the books. But they also went ahead and, like, rendered it in actual 3D. Um, I know that Robert Rodriguez, you know, has, you know, he's always done whatever the fuck he wanted to do. And the fact that James Cameron was actually the one doing this film prior to him kind of goes to show you that, like, you know, if Latinos are giving the fucking chance... <laughs> we can even do James Cameron's uh, work <laughs> and he's Canadian so it's like a double uh, <laughs> on Tandra for um, foreigners taking your jobs pretty fucking funny number six it's a classic um, but many of you might not have seen it definitely check it out it's called Barbarella <laughs> and it has a very very uh, cool uh, implication for cinema uh, not only because, yeah, it was like a um, nudie flick, uh, you know, throwback, but also it was adapted from a comic book um, and kind of a superhero vibe and stuff like that. And they did the best they could with the budget <laughs> and the theme. Again, if um, the only thing missing from this is like the winky winky shit from Deadpool and be like, Haha, we're trying, guys. Uh, but otherwise, I I was really involved with this movie as a child and as an adult, you know, I'm like, you know, the fuck, the stuff they did with this was like really fucking awesome. Um, number five, whoo, Akira. Oh man, I love this fucking movie. Um, yeah, it's uh one of those classics that you know it gets better and better the more time I see it. Um, if you haven't seen like any of the um the manga and stuff, definitely go check it out. Because it's one of the best things um, to come out of, like, Japanimation. Um, but also, in cinema, like, again, I'm kind of pissed off that, like, the Academy doesn't recognize animation outside of uh, Disney. Because this movie should have been nominated for Best Film. Sorry, Lion King, you have a lot of fucking competition. Uh, number four, The Crow. Oh, fuck. The way James Obar drew The Crow was reminiscent of, like, um, Iggy Pop. And I know that when Brandon Lee was cast, people were like, oh, I don't know if he can pull off that skeletal, pure muscle leanness. And they were wrong, man. Brandon Lee just fucking nailed this part and unfortunately died making the movie but if you look at it, Alex Progress, the, the fucking, the cinematography, uh, the atmosphere, 
the soundtrack, I mean, the camera movement, this is one of the best fucking comic book movies of all time. But not only that, it is really, really well adapted because it screams out of, like, the blackness of the pages. You know, the gothic stuff is there. Um, I think that... Uh, it's a disservice to um, comic book fans who have never seen this movie and don't consider it one of the best comic book movies of all time. Speaking of which, number three, Watchmen. <laughs> it's one of the best adaptations that I have seen. Uh, one of the writers, uh, uh, Metal Gear Solid Snake himself, uh, David Hayter, um, he was one of the writers and he really, really kind of delve really deep into the script and was able to make the filmable movie filmable. Zack Snyder and crew did an amazing job to bring it all together. Uh, it was a movie criticized for being too faithful. <laughs> Fucking assholes. Uh, but to me, it's one of the best adaptations. You know, why is it number three and not one? Well, quite sadly, because the first two are pretty fucking faithful as well i mean these things are amazing you know akira the crow watchman who would be number two robert rodriguez and city that's right a surprise fucking movie that grabbed everybody by the throat and never let it, the audience went anywhere i mean it was like one of those fucking cultural epics that you were like what the fuck it, it looks like the comic um and it's really dark not only visually but thematically um, again, I have two Robert Rodriguez movies here. He really fucking knows his shit. Now, who could be number one? <sighs> Come on. Dick fucking Tracy. Have you seen that movie? Oh, also do yourself a favor. Watch it in black and white while you're at it. But with the colors, um, it just jumps at you. It just looks like a classic pop art movie. And if you watch it in black and white, it looks like a straight up noir movie like a sister a movie of Sin City. So, Dick Tracy, the cars, the makeup, the music by uh, Broadway Steve Sondheim, uh, the acting by Warren Beatty, and Madonna. Um, fuck, all, you know, Al Pacino is the bad guy. <laughs> it's, fuck, there's like a star-studded cast there. Uh, top-notch acting, top-notch everything. Do yourself a favor. Watch Dick Tracy. Own it. Love it. Really, really uh, worship it. And yeah, it's a Disney movie. Go figure. All right, so what are my personal favorite movies based on comics? Well, I have a nice assortment for you. Number 10. It's a surprise. It's a Marvel movie. It's a Ang Lee's The Hulk. Why do I like this movie? <laughs> you might ask. Well, you see, I grew up watching the Bill Bixby TV show, um, and I really liked that one. It was very melancholic, kind of like a soap opera with some, you know, green giant every once in a while. Well, this movie took the approach of comic books really well. Um, I know that Stan Lee was just a gamma radiation, but Ang, uh, Ang Lee and his wife um, did some research writing the script, and they came up with a trifecta of nanonites, genetics, which they show you which animals they got the genetic uh, inspiration from, and also um, gamma radiation. Brilliant. Um, but not only that, Ang Lee um, edited the film in a way that made it seem like a comic book. Uh, the editing was really vibrant. It put off a lot of people, but I fucking got it. I loved it. I loved the dynamic of father and son and how, um, you know, Anger triggers triggers the nanonites and uh, enhances the uh, muscle memory tissue of um, repressed memories and anger as a trigger for um, you know becoming the Hulk and having the nanonites regenerate a lot of mass muscle. Fucking brilliant. I also like Nick Nolte in there. Uh, Eric Bana as the Hulk. Um, Jennifer Connelly. Oof awesome fucking film um from start to finish i fucking loved it and features a uh, danny elfman um soundtrack that's not shit which i love it um number nine v for vendetta uh how can i not love this fucking movie 
um, I was able to get a mask of this um, when I went to a Comic Con. So entering the movie with the V for Vendetta mask cost some stir, and it was great. Um, and now it's used as a protest. And what can I say? I mean, remember, remember the fifth of November, one of Natalie Portman's really great movies, Hugo Weaving as V is amazing. That the director is pretty fucking awesome. What can I say? After the success of The Matrix, the Wachowskis produced this movie. Fuck yeah. Number eight. I mentioned this movie again. Another Marvel movie. Spider-Man 2 by Sam Raimi. A lot of love for that movie. Uh, not only that, because uh, it has a redeeming villain at the end. Uh, Doc Ogg, played by Alfred Molina. Oh man, such a great villain. Uh, like an angry nerd. Um, that's a good mentor for um, Peter Parker. I don't know. It's fucking amazing. Um, number seven, one of my favorite ones, The Dark Knight Rises. Not The Dark Knight. And I'll tell you why. The Dark Knight keeps me on the edge of my seat. Uh, I wouldn't say it gives me anxiety, but it's like I just can't stop watching and it has me like intense too much. Dark Knight Rises is about depression, and I fucking love that. It puts me mellowed out, you know. It's not that I'm emo or, sh- or something, but I, I understand depression. I don't like to watch a movie to make me feel like the clock is ticking, which is what The Dark Knight is. Dark Knight Rises is depressing and fucking sad, because we'll never see a, a Christopher Nolan movie featuring Batman again. Um, number six, another Batman movie, Tim Burton, 1989. Why do I like it? I grew up with it. I memorized the whole fucking movie phonetically, meaning just by hearing it, um, before I spoke English. I watched it that much. It was so gothic, and, um, I think the design by Anton Furst, um, the crazy designer, did wonders for me as an artist. I really loved that film. Really dark, really gothic. Number five, very recent movie, Man of Steel. Why do I like it? Because it's a movie about um, an alien. And um, me, being from Mexico, I can totally fucking relate. (laughs) You know, um, but also there is a lot of fear that this movie was uh, predicting. And you can see it ahead of time. Um, The filmmakers were brilliant. You know, they realized that immigrants make this nation better, uh, that we have potential. Um, and yeah, you know, if killing alien Hitler is bad, sign me up, motherfuckers. Number four, the sequel to Man of Steel, Batman vs. Superman. How can I not love this amazing movie? I mean, the extended cut is my favorite. It feels like a Robocop from 1980s movie. Um, really dark, really thematically adult. Um, even somebody who doesn't like uh, comic book movies, like my brother Mario, liked this movie. Um, he's a military dude. Um, and yeah, I mean, the themes, the music, the pacing, the tempo. I think Zack Snyder and Chris Terrio did an amazing job, and also David Goyer. The tempo of this movie is fucking amazing. Uh, I feel... Uh, redemption, and I wish uh, the Snyder Cut comes out, because it'll definitely be on this list. Number three, surprise, surprise, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Again, um, all four turtles were amazing. I was really into uh, Raphael as a kid. I always played Raphael in the arcade. Uh, Raphael was my favorite uh, Ninja Turtle toy, and uh, seeing him be kind of like the bad boy um, featured in the movie, I was like, fuck yeah, he's the loner. He's kind of like the main person, uh, you know, in the movie. It was dark. It was funny. It was amazing. It didn't take itself as a joke. It did a great job with the martial arts. Shredder was fucking badass. Pl- Splinter was great. Uh, O'Neill was awesome. Number two, The Crow again. Uh, It was one of the first films that we saw when we first moved to the U.S. I think that either HBO or Showtime or one of those channels, premium channels, had a preview weekend. And my brother Mario, or yeah, I think my brother Mario might have uh, taped it. I know it's illegal, but whatever. Um, (laughs) He taped it for me. And I used to watch that movie all the fucking time, man. It was dark. It was like... um, If Batman made me fall in love with dark stuff as a child, The the Crow definitely uh, prepared me for growing up. Fucking amazingly beautiful. Uh, Number one, my favorite 
comic book movies? Watchmen, of course. Um, because it has a trifecta of um, good reviews by people who know the source material. Um, admiration from uh, the right people who actually understand the film, understand the thematics of film, and understand acting, cinematography. The way Zack Snyder used slow motion is the same way Alan Moore uses multiple panels to show the passing of time. Um, they criticized Zack Snyder because he used slow motion this one in 300. In 300, it was made um, to showcase splash pages, and because there wasn't a lot of material with 300, you could uh, elongate the film that way. But with Watchmen, it was more there was too much material, and he really wanted the dumb fucks who have attention deficit disorder or like can't fucking stand still without a fucking joke every 10 minutes to like slow the fuck down and appreciate what was going on in the film. The acting, the themes, oh man, it's amazing. The characters, the soundtrack, I mean, you should check out my review on it. It's, it's down here. Um, so yeah, Watchmen, my favorite films based on comics. So yeah, there you go, guys. That is all the time we have. Um, so let's uh, hope that after this Oscars, people learn more about comics spread more about these movies and if you have any other movies that you want people to watch to instruct them and to teach them about comic book history and film appreciation fuck yeah go ahead and do it diversity is the key the monopoly of one studio to rule them all fuck sauron later dinasia dc